Kumusta kayong lahat? My fellow workers. To our resource person, Ms. Adaya. To our participants. To our participants of the country. Responding to our invitation to this webinar. Addressing students. Met addressing students. We hope to learn about, of course, metacognition as well as strategies that can be used for distance learning. This online forum is brought to you by the Project STAR or Science Teacher Academy for the Regions of the Science Education Institute, Department of Science and Technology. We're expecting a total of 100 mathematics teachers preferably teaching in the secondary high school, who have signed up. And I wish that you all find this forum uh, valuable to you as a professional and hope that learnings may be applied to your teaching journey, especially in this time of pandemic. We hope to have you till the end of this seminar, this webinar, because we have a few assessment questions for you to answer. Simple questions to gauge your understanding of this webinar. Also, there would be a question and answer portion at the end uh -huh. where you may express your views, opinions, or questions through the chat box or even speak, speak it out if you wish. I will not keep this long, uh, this uh, message. Uh, so I wish you magandang umaga ulit sa ating lahat and uh, stay safe all. So at this point, uh, I would like to introduce our resource person. He's one of the youngest and most promising mathematic, mathematics educator of the country. She's none other than Miss Adaya Presto from Palawan State University. Ms. Presto is a professional teacher and in fact, she was the eighth placer in the licensure examination for teachers secondary level in 2013. She's currently uh, an instructor, a faculty member of the Palawan State University Laboratory High School. Uh, she worked there from August 2013 to current date. She's currently doing her Doctor of Philosophy in Mathematics Education at the Philippine Normal University. She had her Master of Arts in Education, major in Mathematics also from 2013 to 2018 at Palawan State University. And for her Bachelor of Secondary Education in Mathematics, where she emerged as magna cum laude, uh, she had it from 2013 at the same university. Ms. Presto has been resource, acted as resource person in various occasions, uh, like uh, the regional training in language strategies in teaching science and mathematics in May 2019. Also, in the seminar workshop in Vedic Mathematics for BSED and BSEED students in February 2019. Also, uh, a seminar workshop on teaching mathematics through problem solving for PSU faculty members also in May 2018. And uh, at the regional training for in-service teachers on teaching mathematics through problem solving under Project STAR also at Palawan State University in April 2018. Okay. So she has a long list of seminars and trainings attended, which I have not included in this uh, introduction anymore. So without further ado, it is a great pleasure to have with us today 
Miss Adaya Presto to talk about addressing students' metacognition in distance learning. Thank you, Miss Adaya. Mayad nga adlaw kanindong tanan. Good morning, everyone. Today, we're going to discuss about addressing students' metacognition in distance learning. Here are our objectives for this topic. At the end of this webinar, you will be able to define metacognition, explain the importance of helping students develop metacognition, identify metacognitive strategies that can be used in distance learning, and incorporate metacognitive strategies in learning materials or modalities for distance learning. To achieve these objectives, we will discuss the following. Number one, metacognition. Second, importance of helping students develop metacognition. Metacognitive teaching strategies, such as metacognition frames, learning logs, and reflection prompts. And we will have a sample module with metacognition frame. To begin with, let us start with metacognition. What is metacognition? What do you know about metacognition? Metacognition is commonly referred to as thinking about thinking. This word was derived from the Greek root word meta, meaning beyond, and the Latin word concenere, meaning getting to know. The concept of thinking about thinking starts with the Greek philosopher Plato in 400 BC, but it was John Locke in 1690 who first mentioned about the concept of children reflecting on their own thinking processes. However, the word metacognition was made famous by the American psychologist John Clavel in 1970s. According to him, metacognition refers to higher order thinking which involves active awareness and control over the cognitive processes engaged in learning. Here are other definitions of metacognition. O'Leary and Slautsky define metacognition as the ability to represent and access our own cognitive processes. In addition, Sajna Jalil defined metacognition as a regulatory system that helps a person understand and control his or her own cognitive performance. And according to Chakwa, Max Faden, Divine Indorius, metacognition is consciousness of one's own learning or rational process. Now, why is it important to help our students develop metacognition, especially now in the midst of this pandemic that education will be delivered through distance learning? According to Flavel, there are two components of metacognition. We have metacognitive knowledge and metacognitive experiences or regulation. These two areas are distinct, but they are interrelated. Metacognitive knowledge is defined as awareness of one's thinking. It includes understanding of what we know, what we don't know, and what we want to know. It's like the KW, KWL chart. And it also includes understanding of cognitive processes and learning approaches. Questions like, what do I know about this new topic in math? How do I study best? What tools help me learn? These questions all engage metacognitive knowledge. Now, giving opportunities for our students to answer questions like this, we are helping them to assess their own abilities and reflect on their own learning processes. Now let us proceed to the second component, which is the metacognitive experiences or regulation, which is defined as the ability to manage one's own thinking processes. Managing one's own thinking processes means to think strategically, to solve problems, set goals, organize ideas, and evaluate what you know and what are the things that you know. It also includes the different adjustments that the person makes in order for him or her to control his or her own learning. For example, a student was given a problem about the area of erection. 
and then upon solving it, he remembered that he was able to solve a similar problem when he was still in elementary. And so he decided to use a similar strategy on the problem that he is solving at the moment. Now, in a nutshell, metacognitive knowledge is thinking about what you know and how you learn best. On the other hand, metacognitive experiences or regulation is thinking about how to process and how to apply what you know in specific tasks or problems. Now, here are variables that are significantly related to metacognition. First is we have academic achievement. There are various studies that say that metacognition positively affects academic achievement, academic achievement of students across learning areas. Aside from that, metacognition also positively affects self-efficacy. Self-efficacy, as defined by Bandura, is, in, is an individual's judgment about his ability to carry out a task successfully. Aside from that, helping students develop metacognition also can improve their mathematical modeling capacity. What is this mathematical modeling capacity? Mathematical com modeling capacity is the ability of students to identify, mathematize, analyze, and make comparisons. So if you want our students to develop their academic achievement, their self-efficacy, and their mathematical modeling capacity, we can start with providing activities that can address their metacognition. Now that we are delivering education through distance learning, here are the things that metacognition can help our students. So metacognition in distance learning enables students to engage in reflective learning as they learn specific content. It also helps students to understand and regulate their own learning. And it allows students to monitor their progress and modify their strategies to improve learning outcomes. Now the next question is, what are the metacognitive teaching strategies that we can use in distance learning? First is we have metacognition frames. Metacognition frames are writing tools that provide structure and um, phrases for our students that can guide them in writing. There are different kinds of metacognition frames according to its purpose. So let's start with metacognition frame for stating knowledge. I know that I know something about. First, in addition, finally, now you know something that I know about. Another frame is Metacognition frame for knowing how. I know that I know how to. First I, after that, then, finally, when I have completed these steps, I have shown or proved that. Then we also have metacognition frame for knowing steps and procedures. I know several ways to use, represent, or solve. I begin. Then I, after that, finally, and by doing these steps and procedures. Another metacognition frame is for solving a problem. After reading the problem, I know first, second, and finally. So these are the metacognition frames that you can use for distance learning. Now let's have some examples. So in this activity, I use a metacognition frame for stating knowledge. This is for grade seven. The learning competency is the learner illustrates the different subsets of real numbers. And the lesson is the set of real numbers. So here is the activity. Choose one subset of real numbers and describe it using the frame below. I know that I know something about, first, in addition, finally, now you know that I know something about. Now let, let us take a look at a sample response of the student, a sample student response. 
So I know that I know something about the set of rational numbers. First, the set of rational numbers is denoted by Q. In addition, the numbers in the set can be written in the form of A over B, where A and B are integers and B is not equal to zero. Finally, the decimal form of these numbers are either repeating or terminating. Now you know that I know something about the set of rational numbers. This time we'll have another example. In this activity, I use um, a metacognition frame for solving a, solving a problem. So this is for grade seven math. The learning competency is the learner solves problems involving sets with the use of Venn diagram. So the lesson is about Venn diagram. Let me read the problem. So the directions first, read and analyze the problem then show your solution using the given frame. So this is the problem. Out of 40 students of Miss Mayumi, 18 have cats and 23 have dogs. If there are 10 students who have both animals at home, how many students do not have cats and dogs? So this is the frame after reading the problem I know. First, second, and finally. Now let us take a look at a sample response for this problem. After reading the problem, I know how to find the number of students who do not have cats and dogs. First, I drew a Venn diagram and labeled its parts. I let C represent the set of students with cats and B for the set of students with dogs. Second, I subtracted 10 from 23 and 18 because 10 is common to both sets based on the Venn diagram. Finally, I subtracted the sum of 8, 10, and 13 from 40. The difference is 9. It means that there are 9 students who do not have cats and dogs at home. So as you can see, the students can also include a, an illustration or a diagram in their response for a metacognition frame. Now let us proceed to another metacognitive teaching strategy, which is the learning log. Learning logs are like diaries in which can, students can, um, can write their experiences about what they are le learning or how they are learning. And this, um, this tool can be used by the teacher in order, in order for his, him or her, in order for him or her to take a look on how students understand the lesson. The teacher will be able to see the perceptions, even misconceptions, and reactions of the students on the topic that they are learning. So we have here content learning log. In under this, we have I have been learning about. Knowing about this topic helps me. This topic reminds me of the part I know the most is the most confusing part for me is and I'd like to know more about. Another learning log is this one, strategy learning log. Here are the phrases under it. I have been learning how to. The most important part is this strategy is similar to. The part I can do the best is. The hardest part is. Sometimes I forget. And I'd like to be able to. Now let's have an example. So in this activity, I decided to use a strategy learning log. This is for grade eight math. The learning competency is the learner factors completely different types of polynomials. And the topic is about factoring trinomials in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c. So we have the directions. Choose one method of factoring trinomials in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c and fill out the learning log below with your thoughts about it. So the phrases are, I have been learning how to. The most important part is, this strategy is similar to. The part I can do the best is. The hardest part is, sometimes I forget. And I'd like to be able to. Now let us take a look at a sample student's response. I have been learning how to factor trinomials in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c using AC method. 
the most important part is finding two numbers whose product is AC and sum is B. This strategy is similar to the slide and divide method. The part I can do the best is getting the product of A and C. The hardest part is finding two numbers whose product is AC and sum is B. Sometimes I forget to consider the signs of the integers while I am finding the two numbers whose product is AC and sum is B. Then I'd like to be able to find two numbers whose product is AC and sum is B faster. Now let us proceed to the third metacognitive teaching strategy, the reflection prompts. Reflection prompts are questions concerning about the content or the process of how students learn it. In a study conducted by Mens and Sin, they formulated or they crafted reflection prompts based on the four categories of metacognitive knowledge. Here are the four categories of metacognitive knowledge, MK1, MK2, MK3, and MK4. MK1 concerns with planning and monitoring of heuristics and strategies. So here are example indicators, reread, rewrite, familiarize, apply, or break down. For MK2, it concerns with evaluating of heuristics, strategies, and self. Example indicators are struggle with, tend to, appears easier, or does poorly. For MK3, it is about awareness of self-possessed knowledge. Example indicators are able to, notice, understand, or happens to me. And for MK4, this is about feelings. It concerns with feelings about self with regard to learning. Example indicators are like, dislike, discourage, or ashamed of. Now let's have some examples. So for the reflection prompts, this is for grade 8 math. The learning competency is the learner solves problems involving systems of linear equations in two variables using a graph, um, substitution method, and elimination method. So the topic is about solving systems of linear equations in two variables using elimination method. Now here are some examples of reflection prompts. The direction is Look, looking back, write your answer for the questions below using two to three sentences. So for the first question, this is under the, cat, the first category, MK1. How did you familiarize yourself with the steps in solving systems of linear equations into variables using elimination method? The second question is based on the second category. In what part of the elimination method do you struggle the most? What is the most? And then for the third reflection prompt, what are the strategies that you discovered in using elimination method in solving systems of linear equations into variables? And this prompt is from the third category of metacognitive knowledge. For the last prompt, we have here explain how you felt during the first time you used elimination method in solving systems of linear equations into variables which is under the fourth category. Actually, um, we are not really required to have all, to have a reflection from, from, from each of the four categories. You can just choose one or two, depending on what we want our students to ponder on. And now, this time I will show you a sample module with metacognition frame. So the module is for grade seven math. The learning competencies are, the learner illustrates the measures of central tendency, the mean, median, and mode of a statistical data. And we also have the learner calculates the measures of central tendency of ungrouped and group data. So let us take a look at this module. So here is the module. 
Okay, let me read it again po. For the overview, in the previous module, you learned how to represent organized data through different graphs such as pie chart, bar graph, line graph, histogram, and all drive. In this module, you will learn about the basic statistical tools that can use in describing a set of data. These are the mean, median, and mode, which are called the measures of central tendency. There are two classifications of data, ungrouped and grouped. In this module, we will focus on the mean, median, and mode of ungrouped data. So here are the objectives. At the end of this module, you will be able to describe the measures of central tendency, compute the mean of ungrouped data, determine the median and mode of ungrouped data, and solve problems involving measures of central tendency. So I will only present lesson one, mean of ungrouped data, as I mentioned earlier. So here, hello, how are you? I hope that you are happy, healthy, and ready for our first lesson in this module. Our first lesson is about the mean of ungrouped data. Now fasten your seatbelt and let us begin. Do you enjoy a hot do you enjoy having a hot show on a rainy day? Do you know that this savory dish is part of the colorful history of Palawan? Cholong is a localized version of the Vietnamese pho, which is a rice noodle soup. It was brought by the Vietnamese refugees who arrived in Palawan in 1979 to seek for political asylum because of the Vietnamese war. At present, the Vietnamese refugees camp, camp or DRC is completely gone, but there are still some Vietnamese restaurants in our city. Mr. Castro owns a Vietnamese restaurant in Barangay Pinigiban. In the first week of August, he recorded the number of servings of Chow Long ordered by customers every day. The table shows the data he gathered. Here is the table po. For day 1, 26. Day 2, 34. Day 3, 35. Day 4, 30. Day 5, 30. Day 6, 38, and day 7, 24. Now, what do you think is the number that best represents the number of servings of Cholong that Mr. Castro sold during the first week of August and why? So, write your answer in this space provided below. Then, now let us proceed and find out if your answer is correct. So, here is the discussion part. The mean, also known as arithmetic average, is a value that can represent the set of data. Its symbol is x bar. It is also called the center of gravity because it balances all the values in the data. The mean can be computed using this formula. The symbol, this symbol is read as the summation of x. It means to get the sum of the values in the data. That is x sub 1 plus x sub 2 plus x sub 3 plus x sub n. Under the symbol is n, which represents the total number of values in a data. Now, based on this formula, the mean is the sum of the values divided by the total number of values. Sounds easy, right? Let us go back to the number of servings of Cholong that Mr. Castro sold during the first week of August and use this formula. So for the first example, to find the number that best represents the number of servings of Cholong that Mr. Castro sold during the first week of August, we will compute the mean. Based on the table, the data are as follows. 26, 34, 35, 30, 30, 35, 38, and 24. So using the formula, x bar is equal to summation of x over n. So the answer is 31. On the average, Mr. Castro was able to sell 31 servings of Cholong during the first week of August. So did you also answer 31? If your answer is yes, well done. If your answer is no, that's okay. We can do better in the succeeding activities in this module. Besides, we are still in the process of learning. And then for the next example, the next example is about Makise, who rides his bike daily. And then the students will need to find the average distance that Makise traveled riding his bike during um, those 15 days. And then we are already done with the discussion part. Now it's your turn to answer a problem. In the activity, this is where I included the metacognition frame for solving a problem. So this problem, the problem here in the activities is still related to the problem presented in the exploration. 
During the month of August, the average number of servings of cholong that Mr. Castro was able to sell is 33. On the other hand, the data below show the number of servings of cholong sold during the month of September. 40, 33, 20, 28, 31, 26, 34, 31, 21, 22, 25, 32, 23, 21, 25, 29, 35, 20, 31, 21, 28, 30, 21, 21, 32, 28, 38, 36, 34, and 24. So here is the method emission frame. What is the average number of servings of cholong that Mr. Castro sold during the month of September? Show your solution using the given frame. After reading the problem, I know first, second, and finally. Then we still have other questions. Based on your answer in the first question, in which month did Mr. Castro have better sales of cholong and why? And then another question is, on September 27, Mr. Castro was able to sell 30 servings of cholong. Considering the average number of servings of cholong sold during the month of September, how will you describe the sales of cholong on that day? Um, this question aims to prepare the students for the question in the evaluation. And well done. If you want to know if your answers are correct, please see the answer key on the last page of this module. And then this time you can pause for a break before we continue with the evaluation. So here is the evaluation. The following set of data shows the scores of 35 students in their 50 item periodical test. So those are the scores. The first instruction is to compute for the mean score. And then second is what information does the mean score tell you? And suppose you're one of the students and your score is above the mean, what does it, what does it indicate about your performance? And then for number four, if your score is below the mean, how will you prepare for the next periodic exam? That's for the evaluation and this one. So congratulations for finishing the evaluation. This is the proof that you have under, understood this lesson. And for the enrichment, how about if you have a large set of data, let's say 100 or more values, is it still possible to compute its mean using the formula? The answer is yes, but it, it is possible, but it will take a lot of work. Now, there is a more efficient way of computing the mean of a large set of data. That is by using the Microsoft Excel. Scan the QR code using your smartphones or enter the link in your web browser to open a tutorial video on how to use the Microsoft Excel in computing the mean. And here is the QR code and have the answer key and of course the re references. So in this module, I also tried to incorporate teaching master problem solving, also um, interdisciplinary approach and contextualization. So, let me go back to my presentation. So let me read the statement. Teaching metacognition is arguably the most difficult aspect of developing a learner's thinking. It is, however, one of the key aspects to promoting deeper understanding and transfer of ideas and skills to all areas of learning. With that, I hope that you have learned something about this topic. So thanks for listening and once again, good morning for to everyone. For LJ. Okay, so thank you very much, Ms. Adaya Presto, for that uh, very informative uh, presentation about metacognition. So let me let us uh, let us give a few minutes uh, to the participants for them to digest everything, and then uh, we are now ready. Uh, 
we are now opening the floor for questions, concerns, uh, clarifications. Uh, you may unmute the microphone if you have questions, or you may even write it down in the chat box. Okay, so who will shoot the first question? Okay, we have here comments. Thanking you for that presentation. Okay. Anyone? Mabilis ba? Mabilis bang presentation? I think it was clear. It was... Uh, sige. Any point of clarification? Okay, there's one question, Ms. Adaya, from Patricia Tetoya. Has this been applied in an actual class setup online? Online, I think for, yes, you can apply the method related teaching strategies here. You can use the reflection prompts, for example, one question only, and then the students can answer for. Also, it is a uh, method related teaching strategies can be used um, for in learning playlist po, pwede rin. Hello po. Is it necessary daw to put an answer key in the module? What is its relevance? Uh, in the module po, yes po. In order for the students to see if their answers are correct and if they really understood um, the topic. But they can take a look at it po after they are done with the module. With the, after they are done answering the module. Because sometimes even us, if we answer a question and then we don't know if our answer is correct, it gives us anxiety and we think we think a lot about that. And so if we are giving opportunities for our students to see the answer, then they will know that I'm doing well. I know this already. I was able to answer it correctly. Okay, so the next one is uh, thanks for the shared metacognitive strategies. It's very useful if you want to check students' understanding in problem solving. See again. Any more questions from the audience? Okay, so another question, Ms. Adaya, how can we mitigate the possibility that learners are going to answer first without looking at the answer key or solution key? I think that is where if we place answer um, uh, teaching students knowledge on topic. In the first question, how can we mitigate the possibility that learners I think this is where the um, this is where being honest comes in. So I think there should be um, not really a rule, but the students and teacher, the students and the teacher should have um, an under and not really an under. They should have they they need to make a rule that the students need to answer first the module before they can take a look at the answer key. It's establishing, they need to establish a rule. And I think this is one way of teaching our students to be honest. Yun po. If we please answer how do you evaluate students' knowledge on topic? Um, they need to answer it first po before they can take a look at the answer key. They need to try it first. The answer key um, is a tool in order for them to know if their answer is correct. But after they have answered the activities and the evaluation. Hello, Paul. 
Thank you. So any more? And the answer key po is, is included at the last part of the module. So students will see the evaluation first and then the activity and the evaluation first before the answer key. Okay. Why is it important to include the answer key in the module? And then so uh, next for this to end people. Yeah. And the next one is, is it advisable to use the reflection prompts along with the self-learning modules as a form of additional assessment for learning? I find a potential application in my pre-cal classes. First one. Um, for the waste import, oh, po. Um, for me, including the answers in the module will help the students see if they are doing doing um if they are really learning if they know it already and for the next one is it advisable to use a reflection prompt with self yes po yes po we can really use the reflection prompts with self-learning modules it will not, not only it will help the student but it will also help the teacher to see the perception, misperceptions, and the reactions of the students about what they are learning. Another question here. He's a non-reader. Non -reader. How can he come? each phrase in a strategy learning log for example I find it difficult to apply in my class perhaps this strategy is good for advanced learners um, if a learner is not a reader for example the setup is online I think the teacher can ask that can use the metacognition frame um, directly po. Or with guidance along for the teacher will just read the metacognition frame or it can be recorded more questions There's one here. Oh, it's a comment. Meron din platforms. Platforms. And interactive setup for this method to work, ma'am. I think it is very useful in these times. What can you call More questions? Wala na ba? Okay, so you can also use um the metacognition frames for in Google Forms if you want to have an is that an offline was it something like that learning playlist you can use the Google Forms for, for the metacognition frames and for the other metacognitive teaching strategies. Okay, so. That's about it. Any final words, Miss Adaya Presto, before we? Uh, I think there are no more questions coming in. Uh, everything is now clear to the participants. So, any final words from you before we close um, the webinar? Thank you very much, Paul, for listening. And I hope that the metacognitive teaching strategies that I shared this morning will be useful for you in delivering education in times like this, in the midst of pandemic. Once again, good morning, Paul. Okay, so with that, uh, we would like to thank our, our webinar speaker, Ms. Adaya Presto, for uh, sharing her insights on metacognition. So, 
Uh, thank you all for participating and I think uh, this has such been an informative session. It's informative morning for all of us and we do hope to see you in our future seminars. So in September, we have lined up another two, two webinars and just uh, check our Facebook page for that announcements. So once again, a big hand to Miss Adaya Presto for that wonderful presentation. And, and have a nice day, everyone. Stay, stay safe. Thank you very much.